Hello everyone, welcome to this video. In this video, we shall be learning about the solvability of operator equations in terms of their homogeneous counterparts. So if you remember in the previous video, if you remember first of all, what are the operator equations at all? So let me write down all the operator equations. We had studied about four operator equations involving a compact linear operator. The first one include uh, Tx minus lambda x is equal to y where y is some given uh, vector in the norm space x and lambda is the given complex non-zero complex number right so this was the first homo uh, operator equation and its homogeneous counterpart is tx minus lambda x is equal to zero right and the third operator equation includes the adjoint operator so it acts on the functionals which are taken from the dual space of the norm space x. So let's call that by f. So we have t cross f by this lambda f that is equal to g. So this is the third operator equation and its homogeneous counterpart that is uh, t cross f by this lambda f that is equal to zero, right? So we had this uh, these four operator equations and we have already seen uh, uh, we have already saw about the solvability of equation one in relation with equation four and the solvability of equation three in relation to equation two now let's see what is the relation or the solvability of first equation with respect to second and third equation with respect to fourth right what is the relationship of these equations among themselves so we have a theorem which tells us exactly this thing. So here we have a theorem. It tells us that if we are given some compact linear operator on some normed space capital X and lambda that is given to be a non-zero complex number, then the first equation Tx minus lambda x is equal to y. This has a solution x for every y. So we, uh, if we take some y here, uh, or in fact, if you take any y here from the normed space, this equation number one would have solution when, whenever the homogeneous equation has only the trivial solution and vice versa. Whenever the homogeneous equation has trivial solution, then equation one would have a solution for every value of y. And moreover, in this case, whatever is the solution of equation one, that would be unique. So oh, there would only be one solution to this equation and moreover, the operator t lambda, which is what t minus lambda i, that is a bounded in uh, that has a bounded inverse in this case. Its inverse would exist, and that would be bounded in nature. So this is about uh, the first and second operator equation. About the third and fourth operator equation, let's see what result do we have. They say equation three that is t cross f by this lambda f is equal to g that has a solution f for every value of g uh, whenever equation 4 has only the trivial solution and moreover equation 4 has the trivial solution whenever equation 3 has a solution for every value of g. So we have a if and only if condition in this case also and moreover the solution of equation 3 in this case also that is unique in nature. So this is the relationship between the equation 3 and equation 4. So this equation three would have a solution whenever we have a trivial solution for this equation number four. And conversely, equation four would have a trivial solution whenever equation three has a solution for every value of g. So let's see its proof. The proof is quite simple. So here, in order to prove the first part, let's see what do we have. So we assume in the very starting that equation one has a solution x. So in this case, we assume equation one has a solution for every value of y. This is known to us, right? And we have to prove that for equation two, x is equal to zero is the only solution. That means we are talking about the trivial solution in this case. So let us now prove using the method of contradiction. So here we assume that equation two has a non-trivial solution. So that means in this case, x1 is not equal to zero. We assume that x1 is a solution of equation two and that is a non-zero solution. So now also because we have assumed that equation number one here has a solution for every value of, for every given y. So that means 
uh, in this case if we consider y to be x1 in that case also we would have a solution for equation 1 so we assume y is nothing but x1 and what was that x1 that x1 was the solution non zero solution of equation 2 so we exist y is x1 so our operator equation would look something like this so it would be like t of x minus lambda of x that is equal to x1 now we are saying this equation has a solution so let's call that solution here x and x as x2 right so we call this as our solution in that case uh, it the equation would look something like this t x2 minus lambda x2 that is equal to x1 and in operator form we can write this to be t minus lambda i multiplied with x2 that is equal to x1 and what is this this is the operator t lambda so that means we have t lambda x2 is equal to x1 now again because equation 1 has a solution for every value of y so that means if we take y is equal to x2 in this case then also that uh, there would be some solution so let's call that solution to be x3 so in this case uh, our equation would be t lambda x3 so it would be equal to x2 because x3 we are calling the solution here in this case as x3 right so if we continue in this manner because x3 is also a member of x so uh, we can call y is equal to x3 for this y also we have a solution for equation 1 let's call that as x4 and we continue in this manner so we reach at uh, a step where we would have t lambda raised to power k minus 1 xk that would be equal to x k minus 1 in a similar fashion so we have a chain something like this we have selected x1 which was some non-zero member right this x1 because uh, was equal to t lambda x2 because x2 was the solution for this operator equation where y was considered to be x1 and similarly this x2 again could be written as equal to t lambda x3 so we have just substituted the value of x2 here and similarly moving further we have this equation so we can club down the terms here the, the these terms they are same now this would become t lambda square and so on the last term would be t lambda raised to power k minus 1 times xk all of these they quant these quantities they are zero however if you take the last term the last term from here this term so you would see that if you apply t lambda on to both sides of this equation so what do you have on the left hand side you have t lambda is to power k x k and on the right hand side you have t lambda x k minus 1 now this thing is equal to 0 because x k minus 1 is some non-zero quantity which satisfies equation 2 right and uh, so from here we have t lambda is to power k x k as equal to 0 so you see we have t lambda x1 now because in the very starting we have assumed x1 to be the we have assumed x1 to be the solution of equation 2 uh, of equation 2 right so we would have something like t lambda x1 that is equal to 0 so from here we have the first expression and from here we have the second expression over here now if you notice that if, if you notice from here we have this quantity t lambda raised to power k minus 1 x k that is some non-zero quantity and t lambda raised to power k x k that is a zero quantity so that, so that means if we talk about this uh, this vector here x k and this vector here x k both of them they lead to the result that this vector x k that belongs to the null space of this operator t lambda k because when you apply this operator onto the vector that gives you a zero and xk does not belong to the null space of t lambda k minus one because when you apply this operator onto this element you do not obtain a zero here right so that means we are saying we have a vector here which is present in some space here right but is not present here so that means we uh, we can claim this inner space we can claim this inner space as the proper subspace of this bigger space so the null space of t lambda k minus 1 that would be contained in the null space of t lambda k for every k 
so this is we we have generated a result for the containment of these null spaces for every k that means they are not equal to each other for any value of k however we have a contradiction here because according to this theorem which we have already studied they we have some smallest integer such that we have a equality of these null spaces after that integer but we have just generated a result which says we have a proper containment of these null spaces for every value of k so this is a contradiction to our assumption we have assumed that we have a non zero solution for equation 2 but this is not true so that means x is equal to 0 is the only solution which is possible for the equation operator equation number 2 which is the homogeneous counterpart for the operator equation 1 so this proves one part for the first result now let's prove the converse for this result here we assume that x is equal to 0 is the only solution for our operator equation 2 and we have to prove that equation 1 is solvable for every value of y now because we know x is equal to 0 is the only solution for equation 2 that means because of this result that we have already studied equation 3 with any given value of y is solvable so equation 2 is the 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 solution of equation 2 is related to solution of equation 3 by this theorem that we already studied it states that whenever t is a compact linear operator on a normed space then equation 3 has a solution if and only if g is such that g of x is 0 for all values of x which satisfies the equation 2 so using this result because x is equal to 0 is the only solution for this equation that means equation 3 would have a solution and moreover the adjoint operator t cross and what was our equation 3 it was t cross f minus lambda f that is equal to g this was our equation 3 now here we are getting t cross the adjoint operator corresponding to the operator t so this operator is also compact because of this compactness criteria for the adjoint operator that we have studied right so when we apply the same result that we have just proved above here on to t cross right the adjoint operator so in this case it would imply that f is equal to 0 is the only solution for equation 4 which is nothing but the homogeneous counterpart for equation 3 according to the result that we have just proved so this proves that equation 4 would have a trivial solution f0 and according to this theorem because we have a trivial solution f is equal to 0 for equation 4 that means equation 1 has a solution uh, whenever f of y is 0 for all values of f so that means equation 1 is solvable for every value of y here so we started with equation 2 uh, here we have generated its relation with equation 3 and then the uh, relation of equation 3 with 4 by virtue of the result that we have just studied and then we have again linked equation 4 with equation 1 so that's how we reach from equation 2 to equation 1 here now in order to prove the uniqueness here we assume that x1 and x2 they are two solutions for equation number 1 so that means so uh, and they are different to each other right so in this case because both of them they are solutions of equation 1 for a given value of y so t lambda of x1 would be equal to t lambda of x2 right i'm sorry we had a mistake here so uh, i have corrected it now so let's see what we can do for uniqueness here here we are assuming x1 and x2 be the two solutions for equation number 1 if x1 is the solution that means we have t lambda x1 is equal to y and if x2 is the solution we have t lambda x2 is equal to y so if when when we subtract both of these equations we have t lambda x1 minus x2 that is equal to 0 so now what is this if you open this thing up here 
right? So you would have T x1 minus x2. This thing is equal to, uh, minus lambda x1 minus x2. This thing is equal to zero. So this is nothing but your e operator equation two, where instead of x, we are now having x1 minus x2 and x1 minus x2 here. So this is the second operator equation. And according to the result that we have just proved, equation two would only have the trivial solution in this case. So that means the solution x1 minus x2 would be equal to zero. And if this would be equal to zero, we had, we, we would have x1 that is equal to x2, right? So we have proved the uniqueness of the result here. And now about the boundedness, let's see. So this unique solution x, which is obtained by inverting the operator t lambda. That is the solution of minimum norm and how it is bounded. It is bounded through this result. So let's see how. So x, if we take the norm of x, it would be the norm of t lambda inverse y. So this thing would be less than equal to c times the norm of y using this above result here. So that means here we have proved that the solution of here is unique and bounded as well. Now moving on to prove the second part here. For the second part, they are saying equation three that has a solution f for every value of g, if and only if equation four has only the trivial solution. And moreover, if equation four has the trivial solution, then equation three would have a solution f for every value of g, right? And moreover, this solution is unique as uh, we have proved here in part A. So now in order to prove this result, we can proceed as we have, pro uh, we have proceeded through part A, right? In fact, we have uh, reached this thing for when, when we were proving the converse part. So you can try this part by your own. So I hope you'll get through the proof very easily. We are now at that stage where uh, I hope you people can proceed with part B. So you can leave a comment if you have any doubts. Uh, until then, that is it for this video. Thank you for watching.